Now part of York University, the Glennon College campus was once owned by Edward Rogers Wood and his wife, Agnes Euphemia Smart, who purchased it in 1920. After the death of his wife, Wood transferred land ownership to the University of Toronto in the 1950s. At that time, a Toronto committee was looking for a site for a new university. Towards the end of the 50s, the University of Toronto was ready to bequeath the campus to this new university, which would be named York. York settled here in 1960. University enrollments were on the rise, and as a result, this site was soon too small, and the Keele campus opened its doors in 1965. Glendon then became one of the York colleges. It welcomed its first students, who would obtain a Glendon degree in 1965. In September 1966, it was inaugurated by Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson. Glendon's first principal, S. Scott Reed, shaped the vision for the college. A civil servant, a diplomat, and a scholar, S. Scott Reed defined Glendon's mission based on bilingualism and liberal arts, and dreamed of preparing students for civil service. Our story begins in 1966. We will explore the academic and social life at Glendon during its first 10 years. When York University President Murray Ross and Glendon's first principal, S. Scott Reed, contemplated the creation of Glendon, they had to answer a few questions. How to define Glendon? How to make this university college unique? They decided that Glendon would be a small liberal arts college where both the administration and faculty would be student focused. It would also be a national bilingual college. Glendon was created as a liberal arts college, largely inspired by American and British colleges such as Amherst, Swarthmore, Oxford, and Cambridge. S. Scott Reed was a product of the liberal arts tradition and had spent much of his career in the Canadian civil service. His definition of a liberal education reflected this dual experience. It was both academic and pragmatic. I believe there are two halves to a liberal education in this last third of the 20th century. One half of a liberal education consists in gaining an understanding of the world we live in so that we may help to make the world a better place to live in. The other half of a liberal education consists in breaking the influence of the world we live in and finding deliverance from the tyranny of the immediate, the novel, and the transitory. These two halves are mutually nourishing. Each is the necessary consequence of the other. This definition is reflected in students' decision to choose Glendon for their post-secondary education. In 1974, 66.7% of Glendon students stated that they chose to go to university because they were searching for intellectual stimulation, had a thirst for knowledge and culture, and sought personal growth. For Albert Tucker, Glendon's second principal, a liberal arts education involved all these definitions but also included a more intimate and personal side. He believed that the liberal arts college environment was crucial for students' development. Because uh, I think a liberal arts environment gave more freedom to the students. I was very aware when I was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto that I was a part of a big university. And were it not for the history department, <clears throat> I would, it would just all be kind of anonymous. A liberal arts environment in a relatively small college like Glendon. I knew this from my experience at Harvard, where, you know, Harvard makes a deliberate attempt to divide the student body into houses. They don't call them colleges, they're houses. And I had lived for four years as a tutor in Dunster House at Harvard. And I thoroughly enjoyed it, and in a way, I was educated, I mean socially. I had started out as this very young, let's say, uh, young man with, with no experience, no parents, no family, and I found it all 
it all came to a kind of fruition through the four years at Dunster House. So in a way, that was a liberal arts college environment. And I could see that Glendon had the potential to do the same thing for the students who came here. In 1966, Glendon offered seven academic programs, French, English, philosophy, history, political science, economics, and sociology. More programs were added when the need arose, such as the psychology department in 1972. Glendon's administration aimed to develop a flexible curriculum that offered a variety of options to students while maintaining a balance between general education and specialization. Students were required to take four general education courses. This inspired Professor Alain Boudot to create the Department of Multidisciplinary Studies in 1974. In addition to offering new specialization options, it would become the incubator for new programs. C'est une très bonne question. Uh, oui, je pensais c'était au moment où je suis passé aux humanités dans les années 70, hein, début des années 70, et il y avait un programme qui s'appelait à l'époque éducation générale avec quatre euh, sections. Il y avait humanité, il y avait sciences naturelles, sciences sociales et Euh, logique. Enfin, c'est moi qui ai trouvé les noms pour le français parce que ça existait seulement en anglais. Je me suis dit, c'est idiot de ne pas essayer de rassembler tout cela et d'en faire des études pluridisciplinaires qui permettraient d'avoir des programmes euh, sans rien coûter en fait à Glendon parce que c'était déjà des gens qui étaient dans les différents départements. Par exemple, en, en anglais, en français aussi, on pouvait faire un programme d'études du XVIIIe siècle qui seraient euh, intégrés ensemble et ça a permis, si vous voulez, ça a permis de créer des programmes qui n'existaient pas à l'époque. Par exemple, c'est là que sont nées les études des femmes, les études internationales, etc. Today, the multidisciplinary studies department includes Canadian studies, environmental and health studies, and drama studies. It also houses the new biology department. As Scott Reed deferred the moment when students would specialize, he wanted them to first have solid general knowledge and gain proficiency in English and French, regardless of their mother tongue. In his opinion, having two languages would allow students to gain a better understanding of both their area of specialization and the Canadian nation. This is why students were required to take English and French courses in their first two years of study. In their last two years of study, students were required to take two specialized seminars, one on Canada, the other on social ethics. It was at this point that they chose an area of specialization. The programs were therefore a blend of flexibility and constraint, and this is similar to the requirements that exist today. At the time, Glendon's approach went against the flow in the world of higher education. The trend was towards multiversities, that is, large universities with multiple faculties, including arts, sciences, humanities, and professional programs, universities for teaching and for research. These universities could become knowledge industries. York University's Keele campus emerged from this trend, a new Toronto university which had become necessary to accommodate the large influx of baby boomers. In these large universities, however, students could sometimes feel stuck in a very bureaucratic institution where the atmosphere was impersonal. Glendon offered an alternative while retaining the advantages of being part of a large university. At Glendon, the relationship between students and professors was more intimate. The college offered new students the benefits of a small community as soon as they arrived. They were greeted with a welcome ceremony that was almost as formal as convocation. There's a welcoming ceremony for yeah. new students. Oh. And every year, the faculty would dress up in exactly the same as the graduation ceremony. Oh. And it was smaller, of course, the parents, but the students were officially welcomed into the campus as uh, students, and mm -hmm. we were talked to by the big names. And there was music and Latin, and it was very formal. It was very, very interesting. So you really felt that you came in as part of a community. It made a huge difference. The college was a small community, but that did not mean that it was isolated from the outside world. At Glendon, the focus was on teaching, but research was also present through conferences, student forums, and visiting professors. 
In 1970, for example, as a part of an introductory seminar on Francophone cultures, Alain Boudot organized a month-long trip to Martinique where a dozen of his students met writers such as Edouard Glissant, artists, and a number of important figures. Glendon also hosted conferences. The first international conference was organized by Alain Boudot in 1976 and was entitled Identité culturelle et francophonie dans les Amériques, Cultural Identity and Francophonie in the Americas. It lasted four days and attracted scholars from the Antilles, North Africa, Europe, the United States, and Canada. Since Glendon was a new institution, student recruitment was very important. S. Scott Reed, along with some professors, traveled across Ontario and to Quebec, Manitoba, and Alberta. They reached out to private and public schools to introduce the college and its priorities. In the late 60s, Reed even went to Europe to recruit students from the Neufchâtel Junior College in Switzerland, as well as from schools on Canadian military bases in Germany. In Francophone environments, French-speaking teachers such as Alain Boudot held information sessions about Glendon to encourage Francophone students to enroll. Après, euh, Scott Reed m'a envoyé un peu partout. J'ai fait, qu'est-ce que j'ai fait pour essayer de recruter J'ai fait des tournées pour le club canadien. Vous savez qu'il y a un club Et là aussi, c'était très bizarre. J'allais au Québec, j'allais ici, j'étais partout. Euh, le problème est que quand je faisais cette tournée, la première année en 71, 1971, euh, la personne qui était avant moi était M. Trudeau. Alors évidemment, euh, lui avait beaucoup de monde et beaucoup de succès, moi je ne sais pas. As Scott Reed wanted to develop a close relationship with Quebec, he had to negotiate with the provincial government so that Québécois students might receive scholarships to study outside their province. The ideal student was studious, wanted to learn a second language, and was concerned with public affairs. But who really were Glendon's students? Glendon had the reputation of resembling a country club. Not only was the campus beautiful, but the presence of students from privileged backgrounds also contributed to this reputation. Yet, Glendon had students from all socioeconomic backgrounds. The administration, who needed to increase enrollment, encouraged young Canadians from various social classes to enroll. They wish to promote diversity within the college's student body. The more representative the student body of Glennon College is of all the groups that make up Canada, the income groups, the ethnic groups, the regional groups, the more valuable to the students will be the discussions they participate in. This was a zone of privilege, whether it still is, But, you know, the, as I start, said uh, sometime earlier, the demographic was different. Uh, and Glendon College, certainly in the, around 1970, the kind of student who went to Glendon was uh, different from the kind of student who went to Keel and Steeles. That was much more obviously a, let's call it a working class campus. Whereas this was very much a middle class campus uh, with, uh, with I say, people who probably had a certain sense of entitlement and who represented a much smaller share of the, of the age group than would be the case today. Um, so it was, uh, how shall I describe the campus? White, middle class, uh, not particularly with it. If you're looking for, uh, I'm not quite sure where you would have gone, downtown Yorkville. Plates, they all had the Glendon crest on them. There was a high table. Very elite, yes. Um, it's called the Country Club. Yeah, it was yeah, by York. Yeah. But maybe that's just a myth, huh? Oh no, it's not a myth. Oh no, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, compared to York, it was a Country Club. But there was a high table. For Anglophone students at Glendon, before the creation of the unilingual stream, the goal was to become bilingual. For them, this meant learning French. Glendon's main linguistic objective is to help Anglophones to improve their knowledge of French and only secondarily to assist Francophones to become proficient in English. And yet, more often than not, it was the opposite. Uh, it's because the environment was 
really almost entirely Anglo. Uh, if you were a young French Canadian wanting to improve your English, there was no better place to go to because the place was sympathetic to uh, French speaking Quebec. But it wasn't part of it. There were a few instructors who were native speakers of French, but not very many, and largely limited to the French department. Francophone students were more difficult to recruit than the Anglophones. The effort was focused mainly on Quebecois, but with the opening of new Quebec universities, they stayed in the province. The college wanted its student body to be 25 to 30 percent Francophone, a goal it had not yet reached. So recruitment efforts were increased in francophone communities in the other parts of Canada. Bien que de tels étudiants soient anglicisés en partie et tendent à se conformer à l'ambiance anglaise qui se fait actuellement à Glendon, ils nous aideront à former un collège dit national. The concepts of bilingualism and biculturalism were trendy at the time thanks to the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism established in 1963. Was the foundation of the college born from that trend a political ideal? The engagement of the administration towards bilingualism could be characterized as ambivalent. From 1966 to 1976, all signage and most student services were in English only, and the administration worked hard to hire francophone or bilingual professors. We all wanted to see that we got the best faculty there was for these positions that were beginning to open up. But very few of them, very, very few, will be bilingual. And if you found a good French-Canadian in Quebec, and tried to persuade him or her to move to Toronto, to Glendon. Given the character of French-Canadian nationalism, particularly in Quebec, young people did not want to make that move from the towns from Quebec City, uh, from Trois-Rivières, wherever in Quebec. They did not want to make that move to this English-speaking city you know, with an English background. But trying to recruit faculty in the late 1960s was difficult. All over North America, institutions were hiring young faculty. I mean, they couldn't get enough of them in those days. It was very difficult to attract Francophone faculty. There were a few, but not many. And, and the, some of the ones that came here came from France. Uh, as militaire, because in the fr France you could do your military service by teaching French abroad for a couple of years. Mm. So uh, one of them stuck around uh, for a long time, Alain Baudot. C'est compliqué, mais j'étais, je devais faire mon service militaire en France à l'époque, et puis uh, euh, le président Pompidou avait décidé de faire un programme spécial. J'étais capitaine, uh, j'étais devenu capitaine, uh, et puis. Il y avait un programme de, ça s'appelait la coopération. On pouvait aller enseigner à l'étranger au lieu de faire du service militaire. Alors bien sûr, j'ai accepté ça. On m'a offert, on m'a offert un poste à, où est-ce que c'était, attaché culturel à Tokyo ou en Tanzanie. Mais j'ai rencontré le fondateur de Glendon, qui s'appelle évidemment Scott Reed, dans les couloirs du Quai d'Orsay, c'est le ministère des Affaires étrangères en France, et il m'a convaincu de venir à Glendon, tout simplement. Et je voulais vraiment, j'aimais beaucoup l'idée d'une université bilingue, des deux grandes langues du monde, l'anglais et le français, et puis je suis venu ici, et voilà. As Scott Reed's vision for Glendon was a bilingual college to train future generations of civil servants and young Canadians involved in any domain of public life, from arts to politics. Scott was an interesting man. He believed that young Canadians should speak both English and French. He himself spoke no French at all. In 1971, the college received a $100,000 grant from the province to finance its bilingualism. Several projects were launched, including French immersion opportunities for faculty, staff, and students. Albert Tucker was successful, for example, in convincing Professor Gentles from the History Department to learn French. At one point, uh, I said, Ian, you know, I think it would be a good idea if you start studying French. And so he did. And within two years, 
he started speaking French. He, he spent uh, his summers. Uh, it was, uh, I'm not sure whether it was McGill, but it may have been McGill University. So that sort of thing would happen. Unfortunately, it did not happen often enough in departments. Other than the Francophone presence on campus, there were two other concerns about bilingualism at Glendon. Several types of French were spoken since Francophone professors and students came from various French-speaking areas. The Anglophone students who were trying to learn French were disoriented. As for Quebecois students, they sometimes felt that they were being mocked for their accents. The other question was about the term bilingual and what it meant at Glendon. What was the goal of bilingualism? Was it a spontaneous bilingualism, which meant mastering written and oral French and English, or a receptive bilingualism, that is, comprehension of the second language but limited mastery? The vagueness of the objective and the lack of initiatives discouraged Anglophone students who expected to become bilingual quickly. Reality upstaged the dream. It became difficult for Glendon to attract and retain students who not only wanted to become bilingual, but who would also stand strong against the obstacles in their way. Too soon, enrollments dropped to dangerous levels, threatening the survival of the college. Therefore, in 1971, Glendon adopted a temporary measure to increase enrollments. A unilingual stream was created, where students were no longer required to take French courses or courses in French. The spots in this stream were limited. The unilingual stream was eliminated in 1987. The administration wanted Glendon to be entirely residential. In other words, they wanted all students to live in residence. It was believed that in residence, students would receive the best education possible. The Wood residence already existed in 1965, and during the first academic year, the Hilliard Women's Residence was built. This residential college ideal did not work out. Many students left the expensive residences to live off campus. It became difficult for the college to fill all the rooms and expansion projects were shelved. In the early 70s came an important change in residence life, the introduction of co-ed residences. It was at that time, you know, that as a part of the student radical movement, and implicit in it, of course, was the interest in women's studies, was the idea of uh, integrating the genders in the student residences. It seemed revolutionary to many of us at the time. You mean young men and women living together, sharing the same washrooms? No, no, that's crazy. <clears throat> but it happened. <laughs> it happened at that time. Despite opposition from some members of the faculty and administration, students supported integrated residences. Two types of houses were created, co-ed houses and gender segregated houses one for men in Wood, and one for women in Hilliard. So I insisted that we preserve some houses that were exclusively male, some houses that were exclusively female, and then some houses that were totally integrated. Mm -hmm. These changes towards co-ed housing were influenced by the feminist movement and the sexual revolution. In fact, there was even a women's liberation movement on campus, specifically in residences, but it did not gain much ground. Women didn't feel any different because it was 75% women, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we, economics and all the other fields, women predominated. Interesting. So, hmm. can't really, I, we, I, I certainly never felt different from any of the guys. The community living on the Glendon campus seemed to be relatively united in spite of inevitable differences among students. The presence of Francophone students helped the Anglophones learn French, and vice versa. The most noticeable division among students was between those who lived in residence and those who lived off campus. Their experience of this small community was different. At this fair school exists a schism, the side so set that none can plism. The students resident, their spirit raised didn't, when first they tangled with the day sident. But what's distinct, twixt both students. The residents are dazed and the days too dense.
Living in residence meant acquiring independence and having new life experiences. All students, even the days, could be part of campus social life thanks to the Café de la Terrasse and the Pipe Room, a room in the manor basement reserved for social and cultural activities. On campus, and particularly in residence, it was always time to party. Some experimented with illicit substances. And of course drugs. I mean, it was drug heaven. There was a good deal of, uh, of grass, as we called it in those days. Weed, I think, is more commonly used now. But, uh, uh, what was more disturbing was the use of acid. Uh, the only time I ever had to drive young men to the uh, Sunnybrook Emergency uh, Department was when they had uh, been doing acid. Michael Horn was a resident Don at the time. During the first years of the college, the Dons were professors. They were young, close to their students' age. At that time, students rarely had to work for a living during the school year. They had more time to spend on campus, so it was a very lively place. In fact, Glendon's principal lived in the manor. But living on the campus uh, brought one into a kind of closer touch with the students. There was also a nurse who lived on the campus full time and who took care of the students. Social life was not restricted to residences, the Café de la Terrasse, or the Pipe Room. There were other ways of getting involved in college life. Glendon had a variety of clubs, organizations, and committees that students could join. There was the Glendon Student Union and a student council for those who wanted to get involved in governance. Today, the student council and the union have merged in order to better manage student interests. There were fewer clubs then than there are now, but there were still many options. There was a religious group, a film club, and even a Francophile club named Chasse Galerie after a French-Canadian legend. It organized music lessons, a classical music and choir group, dances, French movie nights, and French literature discussion groups. Pro Tem, Glendon's student newspaper since 1962, was a weekly paper that involved many students who would later go on to successful careers in journalism. Students also showed their political affiliations by creating clubs that were aligned with political parties or more informal groups. And it, it was very informal. There was a group of people who, you know, were not happy with any of the political parties. There, there, was, a, there was a liberal and a conservative and an NDP uh, club on campus. Uh, but none of us were, none of us in this informal group were particularly happy with any of them. So um, we we formed this rather informal FRO. And um, yeah, I guess we were, a number of us were always proud of the fact, for, at least for most, for most of the time, we didn't have any Trotskyists on campus. So we were more, <laughs> more, more purely left wing. <laughs> on the other hand, there were more sports teams than there are today. The Athletic Council was responsible for managing the sports programs, the intramural, intercollegial, and inter-university programs. In 1970, and for the fourth year, Glendon was intercollegial York champion. Glendon also had less formal sports activities. In, in those days, was actually an outdoor skating rink down by uh, Proctor. It's fine. I think they've, they took, they've taken it out now. It was... Um, uh, it was it was in be, in behind, and uh, we actually had artificial ice through the winter. So I played on uh, on uh, I played hockey down there uh, regularly. The 60s and 70s were a period of activism throughout the world, and students got organized to push for social and political changes. At Glendon, the great moments of student activism took place between 1967 and 1970. Students got involved by writing articles for Pro Tem, by occupying the administrative offices, or by participating in demonstrations. For example, during the opening ceremony for the Hilliard residence, there was a demonstration against the Vietnam War. Some Glendon students tested the attitude of Canadian customs officers by attempting to enter Canada from the United States as U.S. Army deserters. So Graham Muir and Chris Wilson, if I remember correctly, they uh, went and posed as draft 
American draft dodgers try to get across the Canadian border and were really given a very, very hard time. And they wrote an expose that actually made the national press actually saw uh, witnessing uh, a, a, an American burning his draft card uh, in one of the one of the um, uh, it was in Hilliard, one of the um, TV rooms in the Hilliard, common rooms. On campus, students organized conferences. These forums attracted media attention because of their topical themes and their renowned guests. The Quebec Year 8 Forum, organized by David Cole, took place in November 1967. This conference attracted attention to Glendon from across Canada. The organizers wanted to give students the opportunity to learn about the Quebecois perspective. Prestigious guests attended the student forum, including René Lévesque, Claude Ryan, and Gilles Grécois. Brought in some heavy hitters to talk about both sides of the separatist question and so on and so forth. And you can, there's a little uh, book <coughs> published afterwards with the title Quebec Year 8. <coughs> One of the people who came was René Lévesque, who uh, major, made a major hit. I think he was probably the most popular participant because of his style and his kind of slap dash in those days. The forum titled The Canadians, which took place in 1968, was led by a student named Bob McGaw. It focused on Aboriginal populations in Canada. Many Aboriginal leaders, such as Tony Antoine and Harold Cardinal, participated and criticized the policy of the federal government under Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Sandy McKay, one of the organizers of the forum, explains the impact that this conference had on him. Harold Cardinal took me under his wing, um, and he was very much responsible for my uh, transformation into from a, from a nice little Glendon student to um, a, a much more radicalized and critical social activist. and. Um, that night specifically, if we were standing up because they were denouncing firmly the Indian Act and the manipulation by the Trudeau and Gretchen government uh, to get rid of the Indian Act and all the protections of the territory and any rights or privileges that Native people had, that's, they were the first people to denounce that. The organizers of the following year's forum were inspired by the protests in 1968 at Glendon and elsewhere and chose to name the Anti-Authority Conference the Year of the Barricade. This forum was a product of the previous year's radicalization of the Student Council, including the new Orientation Week, Liber Action. For the year 1968-1969, the members of the Student Council prepared a manifesto entitled, A University is for People. This manifesto criticized the academic and social structures of the university and redefined post-secondary education. Education, as we have defined it, we take to be the only meaningful goal of the university. From the education of its members will come the benefit to society in intellectual, spiritual, and physical terms. We reject out of hand the concept of the university as an institution which must safeguard society's values by simply expanding our means to subdue and exploit nature so that we may fulfill arbitrarily aroused desires and raise the material living standard. These students believe that there is a lack of transparency at the administrative level, as well as a wide gap between students and professors. They rejected Glendon's formal hierarchy. Here are their demands. Therefore, we call for the abolition of all evaluative processes which are other than self-induced, the abolition of the formal course structure, compulsory and non-compulsory, created by anyone but the members of the college, and the immediate removal of all symbols which contribute to the social stratification of various members or groups of the Glendon community. All common room washrooms, cafeteria tables, should be available to all members of the college. A university is for the people, and this realization must inevitably come to all academic institutions in North America. Let us begin at Glendon College. As a result, professors no longer took their meals at the table on the stage in what is today the Glendon Cafeteria. Professors' washrooms were shared with students, and new course experiences were proposed. The students, they were very young, but really, really committed to many of these causes. And of course, you know, in the early late 60s, early 70s, students were marching all over the place. It was going on around us. 
these were people who were involved, they were concerned, they wanted to change Glendon and to change the world. They disagreed among themselves of how to best be done. Um, so it was a very uh, engaged, that's what I, I, I guess a good word, for, at least for me. I mean, I, you know, there were a lot of people I think who went through, go through the school, they get their degree and then, and then they, they move on. But for, there were a group of us that, that uh, the college was more than that. It was, um, it was a great place uh, to really establish who you, who you were and how you thought about the world and that, those sorts of things. This feeling that everything was possible and that we could make an impact on the nation was also present on the cultural scene at Glendon, particularly in the context of theatre. It was a period of time that really merged with, uh, merged with what was going on kind of nationally as much as here. And remember, Glendon was at that point very determined to be kind of a bilingual mm -hmm. country bringing together French and English, talking about a national identity and a national vision. And so it, what we were doing, we, we thought was absolutely part of the, the Canadian theater scene or the writing scene in Canada. That, I mean, Margaret Atwood was a young prof at Atkinson for a couple mm -hmm. of uh, part-time courses, and she was just writing her first volume of poetry, The Circle yeah. Game. A few years after we began, Michael and Dad, she came, and he was very, very young and joined our department. Mm -hmm. Um, so all of those things were going on, both kind of out there and infused here. It, w it was really quite extraordinary when I look back on it. We were awfully lucky to have mm -hmm. been there. there. No degree was offered in drama at that time, but the English department, then the French, offered some courses. English professor Michael Gregory taught the first theatre courses. Big productions of classical plays were shown, and soon young professors were teaching more modern and Canadian theatre. However, students did not need courses to create plays. Theatre also became an extracurricular activity. The students toured with plays such as Oedipus Rex and the effect of gamma rays on Man in the Moon marigolds. They performed on the Kiel campus, at Brock University, and at the University of Western Ontario. For their adaptation of the play, A Midsummer Night's Dream, they created a semicircular stage similar to Stratford's in the Glendon Dining Hall. There was no theatre at Glendon, so student adaptations were much influenced by the Stratford Theatre Group. Other plays were also influenced by alternative and local theatre. One of the first plays presented in the Pipe Room in 1968 was Hair. This play illustrated the social climate in the 60s and student interests. The production was inspired by a student trip to New York to see plays. Creeps, presented in 1974, was a play written by a Canadian man who had cerebral palsy. The themes of the play were controversial, but the students were not afraid of sharing their opinions. Theatre was another means to challenge conventions and share opinions. Creative writing was another way for students to disseminate their ideas. The Dime Bag was a poetry magazine where students could publish their poems. Readings took place in the pipe room. The orderly admires my beard. He comments on the number of kids today who wear their hair long and how dirty a lot of them are. He says an actor from downtown stayed in the hospital recently and that his hair and beard were filthy and crawling with vermin. The orderly admires my beard. He says it suits my face, but that the important thing and admirable thing is that I am clean. The woman in the bed opposite mine agrees with him and they both decide the future and safety of the world depends upon responsible, self-respecting people like me. The orderly admires my beard. I feel humble and proud. I feel responsible and self-respecting for showering this morning before entering hospital and for having the foresight to backtrack and realize I last showered a week ago yesterday. For a few years, Glendon had an orchestra directed by Alain Boudot, but it was transferred to the new Faculty of Fine Arts on the Kiel campus. Through their involvement in college life, students received an informal education, including the arts, political engagement, or even sports. Glendon College has changed since the 60s and 70s, but it is also well-rooted on this campus, and some things remain. The importance of liberal arts, the bilingual debate, and its identity.
Premièrement, le campus. On est en plein milieu de la ville, à Toronto, mais on a un super beau campus boisé, avec plein de nature autour. C'est vraiment comme une belle expérience d'être dans un, un si bel endroit. Ce qui est unique à Glendon, c'est notre campus. Euh, nous faisons partie d'une des plus grandes universités canadiennes et nous avons quand même une expérience universitaire et académique à échelle humaine euh, et d'une diversité incroyable au niveau euh, de nos étudiants et de nos profs. Euh, et pour moi, c'est cette habileté de faire partie d'une grande communauté académique, euh, mais le vivre euh, à, un, à une échelle très humaine. What makes Glendon unique is the small community. Everyone you meet here, whether it's students or your professors, or is always so friendly and welcoming, and it just feels really good every time you step on campus. Glendon is a small campus with small classes, and today uh, this is a great luxury. J'aime aussi la taille de l'école. J'aime bien qu'on ait tellement, euh, tellement peu d'étudiants. Ça fait en sorte que nos classes sont tellement plus petites et qu'on a vraiment des bonnes expériences un plus personnelles avec nos professeurs. Le, le sens de communauté et le fait que les étudiants ont la chance de se faire connaissance rapidement les incite à être plus impliqués dans les activités parascolaires. Uh, Glendon's special because uh, it's a small community. You walk down your call, uh, you walk through your call, and you can run into three people that you know, which may, which gives it a really like friendly, community-based sort of feeling to it. In this way, like I've also found that it's easier for me to practice my French. Even just the smaller class sizes really encourage me to speak French in class, uh, which has been great. For me French. When I was picking my universities, it was actually like my one and only choice. Like I had other backup universities, but it was the only one that I really wanted to come to because it gave me the options of continuing with both the languages that I uh, had in high school, so French and Spanish. Um, it let me have a BA in psychology and a lot of universities only have a BSc right now. Le bilinguisme est au cœur de la mission même de Glendon, et ce depuis sa fondation. Il y a plusieurs raisons de croire dans l'importance du bilinguisme. D'abord, pour des raisons pragmatiques, une personne bilingue au Canada et à Toronto en particulier se trouvera toujours en emploi, il y aura toujours plus de, de possibilités d'avancement. Mais aussi des raisons civiques et politiques. Le bilinguisme correspond à l'idéal qu'on se fait du Canada. C'est une façon de répondre à l'essence et aux valeurs canadiennes euh, et se faisant contribuer à son unité. Il y a aussi une dimension mondiale, globale du bilinguisme anglais-français. Premièrement, on sait que les deux tiers de la planète parlent plus d'une langue. Le bilinguisme c'est une façon pour nous de refléter une réalité mondiale. Mais plus important encore, euh, on sait que le français ne cesse de croître dans le monde, surtout dans le continent africain, au point où on s'attend à ce que ce soit une des langues les plus parlées sur la planète euh, d'ici 2050. Et dans ce contexte, le bilinguisme, c'est aussi une façon de s'ouvrir encore plus au monde et s'assurer un contact plus riche avec les autres cultures.